Well, my first impression of Dini was like uh, I can touch the skin of the woofer. We're not talking of 10 days, we're not talking of 10 months. We're talking of 10 years of your life in one particular club. Troy is Watford Football Club. You know, the, the, the fans love him. Troy is Watford and Watford is Troy, you know. Uh, it's the best way to explain the, uh, this player and, and the club as well. And I come down to two clients that I look at and I think, you know, steel and determination are way above any other. And one of them is a guy called Brian Lara, and the other one is Troy Deeney. If he wasn't a footballer, yes, I'd have him with me on a goal face. And I knew he'd be reliable, hard-working, dependable type. In not even knowing the boy, you know, I'd never met him but he just give you that impression on the football pitch. It was the summer of 2010. Um, we had been tracking uh, a centre forward for three or four months by that stage. We had come to the idea that we were likely to use to lose uh, Danny Graham. Danny had scored 14 goals in a in a difficult season the previous season, and was already attracting interest. So we knew that we were going to lose him at some stage, and we wanted to have somebody in the building in readiness for him moving on. Um, and Troy was the number one candidate. John was great at finding diamonds in lower leagues. Um, and he came up with Troy and he said, listen, our Midland scouts looking at tracking this, this player. Um, he's Walsall's centre forward. He is, he's doing fine this season. He's, he's gradually just chipping away at the goals this season. But um, he's, he's looked at him for a couple of years and he thinks he's, he's got a chance well, yeah, first uh, first meeting with Troy was, um, obviously, he was a young lad, quite headstrong. Um, he'd been in the first team and he, and he was a, a terrific lad. He, he wanted to do well. You know, obviously, that, that was you know, quite evident from the start of the, um, when I went to the football club. Um, and it went from there. He, he just uh, he just blossomed. We encouraged him. We believed in him. Uh, we, we got him working harder, we believe. And um, we feel that we contributed to his his success that he's had over the last few years. He was quite polite to me, but then I was his taxi driver, so he, he had to be polite to me, otherwise he was, he was walking home from the ground. Um, no, he was always, I, I, I think, we had a lot of senior pros in that dressing room. You know, myself and, and Michael Ricketts, who were at the end of our careers, and he was at the beginning, and I think he was, he was a bit like a sponge. I think in the dressing room, um, he'd get changed in the other dressing room with the younger players. Um, in there he might have been a bit of a live wire. I might have had to go in and have a quiet word with him a couple of times. Um, but he was, I don't remember any, any issues other than the any chance you could pick me up or any chance you can drop me off. I liked the look of him. Um, you know, he, he was a big robust boy at Walsall. He was young. He had probably a bit more game intelligence than uh, than his age belied at that point, which I quite liked. He was linking play up. Um, and we thought, yeah, let's let's have a look at this further. So I spoke to the staff and um, we, we, had a, we had another good look at the clips. Um, myself and John went to see him pre-season um, in a game. Um, really liked him um, and thought, you know what? I think he's, there's rough edges there, but I think he can definitely make the step up to the next division. The guy who's found him is a chap called Trevor Morell. I mean, Trevor is a, an excellent scout. I, I had him with me at Celtic uh, and I brought him to uh, Watford to cover the, the Midlands, in essence. Uh, and he did a terrific job in identifying Troy. Um, and really, it was it was his work 
that persuaded me to spend the time to go and check him out and make sure that he was going to be to the level that we needed. The brief. <laughs> Well, uh, quite, quite a, a lot of the time, it was uh, trying to, to look for young, young boys that, were, that weren't really, uh, it was the money, it was the finance, obviously, you know, trying to get, uh, that's why we were looking in, in what I call junior football, you know, the lesser leagues, but young, young talent, uh, and that's where Troy's name popped up, actually. When he wasn't, he wasn't at what I think he was on loan at a uh, conference that might have been Hales Owen or somewhere that way, you know, uh, his name popped up. He identifies a player, so he spots a player, and in this case, he spots Troy. Then provides me with enough information for me to decide whether it's worth spending any more of his time looking at that player. So things such as would the player be available? Would he be affordable? Would he fit into the budget? Um, from the description that Trevor's given me, would he fit the profile of the type of player we're looking for? Uh, and at that point, I then give him the blue, well, the green light for, to head off and do as many games to cover him until he's happy to come forward with a recommendation. I wanted to know from all of the guys who their prime candidate was to be uh, our replacement for Danny Graham on the basis that we knew Danny would go. And Trevor came up with Troy Deeney. I know that um, when the that Watford were interested and the, the chairman had, um, had told me about it, because we you know at the end of the day, Walsall was a selling club. There's no doubt about that. I went into that with my eyes open. And, um, you know, I think his agent had got into him a little bit about coming knocking on the door. And, you know, he knew enough barged it down as, as Troy would do <laughs> for them rough edges, as you said. And, um, you know, want you to know what was going on, basically. You know what it gets like at that stage. I mean, the, the, the buying club wants to pay the minimum possible. The selling club wants the maximum. And you usually get down at those sort of deals, at lower level deals. Maybe the parties are 50, 60,000 pound apart and you literally cannot budge them. The only way sometimes you can budge them is to get the player to personally get involved. Can I recall that? No. Is it likely? Probably. We had a really good insight of what Troy could do on the pitch. And I was convinced, as was Trevor, um, that he would be the right guy. The trick then was to have the money to do the deal. And a lot of that was riding very much on Elton John and Elton John being able to deliver his concert in May at Vicarage Road in 2010, which was a fabulous concert, but without Elton and great, great gratitude to Elton, without Elton, we would never have had Troy because we just simply wouldn't have had the money to go and get him. He predominantly was coming on a sub and he, was an, he, was, he made an impact, which is all you ask of your substitutes, go on and make an impact. Um, probably started together, we probably started half a dozen games or so, something like that. Um, if my memory serves me right. He, he was good for me because I just held the middle of the pitch and he did the running around. When he started playing down the middle, every report I was putting into St John, he's, he's getting better. He's looking, you know, everything about him just seemed to be, and I must have watched him six times and, and I don't think I'd had a bad report on him. When you, when you first clapped eyes on Troy, can you remember the game you first went to? Uh, Swindon away. Um... You always remember when you, you you just know you've got one. <laughs> and I had made up my mind at the end of that game that this was the right type. I mean, incredibly powerful, uh, aggressive, uh, worked ever so hard. And I mean, at that time, Troy had gone through a little bit. We'd, we'd done some background checking, which we did with all players. And Troy had gone through some... Uh, tricky times in the dressing room at Walsall. He he was more ambitious than he felt some of the guys in there were, uh, but he still gave a hundred and ten percent, and that always, always kind of makes me think, yeah, he's he's the right type. He wasn't just an out and out goal scorer. Uh, he, he was a link player, and he was um, an intelligent player as well as as you've seen in in the past years at Watford that. Um, he has become an all-round player, and that was quite evident when I was at the football club, that he had that ability. It was just a matter of how far he wanted to take that. He was, 
young scrawny kid, skinny body, big head, but he worked. And all of the training sessions that we that we had, he was he was excellent. You know, he wasn't like any footballer. They weren't at 18, 19, you're not what you are at 30. Um, it's been a long roller coaster for him through those those years, but you know, I could see how how much he wanted success when he was that young and I could say every training session, every finishing session. And he, he he'll tell you that I used to make him do press ups when he missed the target. That's true. So his chest is my fault. I like to take the credit for that. He was a known striker, you know, he had scored 14 goals for Walsall, albeit a poor Walsall team in League One. Uh, so, you know, I expected 300 grand to be around about where we would have to pay. And as it turned out, it was 350 we had to put down, which just about left us enough pennies to do the other deals that we had to do. We had 150 grand left, but to do the other deals, we needed another two players in that window. Everything on the on the pitch was right, you know. Yes, there might have been issues away from it, but as far as I was looking at, then when you go back, I did some research, you know, and it, and it wasn't good, but I, just, I said to John exactly what I've just said, John, if, he was my, if I was one and I wanted him to work with me on a cold face, I wouldn't hesitate. Then I'd probably have to iron out the issues that might might be away from football, but let's start with what he can do, you know, his strengths. Malky did uh, his research by himself, well, with his staff. Um, so Malky would also do an awful lot of background checking himself to make sure that uh, he was going to be able to handle Troy because Troy, um, you know, he has edges, or he used to have edges. <laughs> Some would say, particularly Arsenal players, that he still has edges. So, Malky wanted to be sure he'd be able to handle him. Footballers certainly need an edge to them if they're going to play top level. There needs to be that edge. And um, we felt that there was nothing jumping out that gave us cause for concern that there was going to be any issues or any problems. Um, we had spoken to people within the dressing room um, I'd spoken to coaches that he'd worked with before and none of them were coming up with saying don't do this, don't take this player, he's trouble. Um, everything was was positive in terms of that. There was no um, behavioural issues that we were uh, that would have probably stopped me from bringing him in. We talked regularly from games, he'd always ring me you know, and say, How's he? I said, John, he's getting better. And, and don't miss the boat, you know. That was my, that was my uh, feelings about it, you know. We were obviously trying to make sure that this was all done covertly and quietly, um, so that we we did our, our homework and, and made sure that other clubs didn't really get sniff of it as well. We didn't want to go into any sort of, um, you know, uh, fight against another club because we would have lost. We don't have, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, we just had to make sure that we, when we were ready and. Uh, myself and John put the dossier to the board, but the board accepted that we were going to have to pay some money for this player. Um, and then we would go to Walsall and, and talk to Walsall about, about actually transferring him. I had Troy, once he found out and his agent got into him, knocking on the door every other day. And I, I had to say to him, I said, look, the deal will happen. It's definitely going to happen, but it might not happen tomorrow or the next day or next week or two weeks because the clubs have to agree your terms. I did get a phone call um, about him, a character reference. I won't say who from, but I gave him a glowing, glowing reference. I said, it's a gamble, but I didn't think it was an expensive one, and it certainly paid off. When did Mr Deeney first come on your radar? Uh, quite late. I was sometimes part of the the the, the, the scouting process, but only from kind of to keep me in, in the picture when it was likely that there was going to be a player arriving or leaving in the way that it was going to affect me. So I used to liaise quite a lot with John Stevenson, who would kind of inform me that there's a player at Walsall who we might be quite close to signing. So so that I had a little bit of warning that um, that someone was going to come. So I reckon I'd probably heard about Troy maybe a month, six weeks before he actually signed. Um, to become aware that there was a real possibility he was going to come and join us. I spoke to him on the phone first, um, so I didn't really get the whites of the eyes first, but spoke to him on the phone 
and had a, had a reasonably good conversation on the phone, told him that I, I think that he could make the next division up um, clearly. I thought he could play in, in the Championship and I thought he could go on to be a 20-goal-a-year player in the Championship. Um, uh, given the, the opportunity and uh, we were a young, hungry club where the coaches would, would absolutely work on his game to make him better. We could prove with Trevor's reports and my reports that the player was up to standard. We could prove with Malky's feedback on his side of things that the player was to standard and we could pr prove statistically that he was to standard. Uh, and then it was can we spend 300 to 350, 400 grand on this player? Uh, and to be fair, they went with it. It all went into a uh, about a 24-page dossier, which was then circulated to Julian Winter, obviously to Malky, so he could distribute it to his staff. And Julian would uh, cede that to the likes of Graham Taylor on the on the board of directors, who was the chairman at the time. Uh, and they would come back with a green light or not. Occasionally you'd get a, a mention from Graham Well, I'm not sure, but he was convinced. No, it's a very simple deal. I mean, you're talking about a player, if I recall, was on at, I'm not going to go into the salaries later on his career, but I don't mind sharing the, uh, the salaries at this point. I think Troy was on about £500 a week. He'll probably tell me he was on less than that and the deal went up to about three and a half thousand pounds a week so when you've got someone earning 500 pound a week to three and a half thousand it's a huge pay rise for somebody at that age and he was delighted with it he had i think it was quite quickly obvious that he had some personality i think that was something we looked forward we looked for in players we had a very young team at, at that time and our remit you know was to try and cut budgets so we were relying on you know i saw Mary Apper had gone from a youth team player to a senior pro in an incredibly quick space of time. And I think um, I think it was part of the attraction of signing Troy was that uh, you know, he's, he's a man, even though he was young, he's a big guy, he's a big personality. And I think that was, you know, it was, it was a good fit for what we were looking for at the time. I just remember thinking, you're going to love it. And you're extremely lucky to get that because he hadn't played for a club that was like Watford, you know, going from Walsall was, was very, very different. Um, so I knew he'd have a, a great time, but you only have a good time if you do the business on the pitch. I think he went for about 350,000 initial fee, uh, increasing, I believe, to about five or 600,000. Well, that's singularly the best bit of business Watford Football Club have ever done, bar none. Um, and Walsall had a, quite a sizable sell-on, which is an interesting story. And the fact that Troy has always stayed at Watford has meant that Walsall have never got the benefit of that. They obviously thought they were getting the benefit at various times in the last 10 years, but uh, to date, that hasn't been activated. Who's this guy that's picked this guy? He can't even get into the team. And when he does get into the team, he's playing wide. He's not playing through the middle. I've never met a player I can't stand. I've met a lot of players that I've been challenged with. And Troy is a challenge. I was still asleep. My wife had got up. She had no idea, obviously, what happened. Went downstairs, went into the kitchen and found Troy in his boxes looking for a cup of tea or something. It was quite an experience for my wife of what on earth's gone on here. There's a guy I've never seen before in my house. Um, and it took some explaining as to who he was and why he was there and why she shouldn't call the police.